Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AMPC's webinar today. Today we've got Max Barnes and Dr. Gareth Ford from All Energy um, that are going to be giving us an update on a really exciting project. So I'll let Matt Deegan introduce that project in a, or projects in a minute. Um, we hope everyone is well and safe uh, out there at the moment, and we're looking forward to being able to come and visit a lot of the membership um, as we start to open up over the next couple of months. For anyone that hasn't used the GoToWebinar before, we really encourage questions throughout the webinar. You'll see on your toolbar a questions tab. If you type your questions in and then throughout the presentation, we'll be able to ask um, Gareth and Max any questions that you've got. So please feel free to send them through as we go through the webinar. So I might hand over to Matt Deegan now, who is the AMPC Sustainability Manager to introduce the projects. Thanks, Amanda. And the first discussion today is by Max Barnes of All Energy on the water recycling pilot. Um, it's a good opportunity to talk about this now because the, the pilot is about to commence construction. Um, just as a quick background, for the water recycling pilot. Um, it, it's to help basically members reduce water intensity, which is a very high priority. And processes have done a good job, you know, in the last uh, decade by reducing water intensity by 9%. But there's a big challenge now around water recycling. So this pilot's to help build confidence and capability around water recycling. And that's what the pilots are, are there to do, to be shared amongst those members that ha will have them uh, to build confidence and capability. So that will be the first uh, discussion by Max. And then we'll introduce Gareth after that. So over to you, Max. Thanks, Matt. Um, so everyone should see my presentation by now. Um, so yes, this is project code 2021-1212. So the motivation here is providing a portable water recycling plant for processors to host um, for a period of time and to identify their most efficient and economic water treatment options. So as, as Matt mentioned there, the background was during the 2020 uh, environmental performance review, we showed that water use intensity has, has decreased on average throughout the whole industry by 8% in the last five years, uh, mainly through your low volume practices and your non-utility and non-production applications. So things like cropping, irrigation, primary belly wash, that kind of thing. Um, so the goal here of this project was to target higher volumes of recycled water for utility applications, um, such as condensers, boiler makeup water, cooling towers, um, and then just stressing, yeah, that there's a non-production uses. So there's no, mo mo no microbial risk from RO or ultrafiltration. However, we're still not ap applying this recycled water in meat production areas during this project. So the stretch targets we were looking at for this project are microfiltration, ultrafiltration, those are those two acronyms there, um, treated class A water at less than $1 per kilolitre and RO treated class A water at less than $1.50 per kilolitre. So I'll just spend a little bit of time just on this um, block, flow, block flow diagram at the bottom here. So this is just showing the overall process of the system that we've designed and developed. So we're taking the lowest salinity wastewaters from within the plant we can find, going through a cooling system, microfiltration and ultrafiltration in series, then reverse osmosis, and then having that class A recycled water to utilities. So within the plant, um, there are a number of different streams that we could choose from. So we have the different influence and effluence there. Um, and then over a spectrum of total dissolved solids where we're targeting less than 10 ppm for RO makeup water or um, 200 to 300 for maybe sterilizer water or then we have that higher tolerance for using those lower intensity um, water recycling applications like um, you know irrigation cropping belly wash that kind of thing. So some suitable streams for recycling that we've been seeing. So we've been going around to the different plants, taking a lot of samples, doing a lot of lab testing. Um, we've been looking at sterilizer water, hand wash water, viscera table water, bore water, anything from the wash cabinet, um, tertiary wastewater treatment plant effluent. So things that are coming out of the DAF, for example, or at the end of an aeration pond. 
um, and any, any other water that's currently recycled within the plant. So essentially what we're searching for is the lowest dissolved suspended solids, the lowest fat source in grease, and the lowest microbe content. Um, ideally up to 100 meter cube per day is the design capacity for the pilot, um, but we can handle a little bit less than that, and I'll talk about that a bit later. So. Just looking at a mass balance on the water streams, uh, we can see if we index this flows to the sterilization water, so we're calling that one one, we see that we can expect about maybe 14% of that from the viscera table water, uh, maybe 70% from cattle wash, 22% from biofilter makeup, cold reuse about 5.5%, evap towers another quarter of that, and then boiler makeup about 17% of that. So what does that all mean? Is that utility water is approximately 24% of the site-wide potable water consumption. And if we were to recycle all sterilization water just as one um, target feedstock, we would be getting about 17.1% of potable consumption being recycled and then saving a further 8.5% from being um, used, consumed out of the tap. So um, just looking at the process, as I mentioned first, there'll be my micro and ultra filtration. So this is a very low cost removal of particulates down to about a 0.22 micron size. So because of that aperture size, it is sterilizing. So there's a physical removal of microbes, not a chemical removal that you might see with chlorine um, and with a high recovery towards 80 to 90%. Um, so the key challenge that we've overcome here or we, we think we'll overcome with our preliminary design, but that first deployment will be a lot of testing, um, is how to deal with any sort of fats, oils and greases build up. Um, so I'll talk about a few little options that we've considered and, and designed. And as I mentioned before, the total cost of ownership is about 50 cents per kiloliter of factoring that capex and opex of this system. Uh, and then the next part in the series is the reverse osmosis. So this one would probably already be on plant for uh, bo uh, sorry, boiler makeup water. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on this one, but it's just concentrating the dissolved impurities by pressurizing against the semi-permeable membrane against the natural phenomenon of osmosis. So this purifies the permeate while concentrating impurities in the concentrate, also known as the brine. Um, so we have the capacity here to tune that recovery ratio from 25 to 75%, depending on whatever target purity we want, as I mentioned in that spectrum just before. And during because of that higher capex opex, you'd be looking at about a dollar fifty per kiloliter for um, per kiloliter of recycled water. So, just running through some basic numbers, um, if we were recycling sterilization water for an 1100 head per day large species processor, so based on that mass balance, we'd expect about 145 megaliter per year of used sterilizer water, uh, or about 440 kiloliters per day if you're running 330 days per year or uh, so with one of these 20 foot container systems you, you can see on the right we could recycle about 100 kiloliter per day at maximum capacity which is around about 23 percent of that site used sterilized water load with 1.9 percent of potable back to plant and that's assuming a 50 percent brine reject but we can tune that how we like um, so assuming a $5 per kiloliter potable water cost, you're saving about $3.50 per kiloliter uh, with about a three year payback. So there are a lot of um, advantages of scale and cost innovations that we can make here. And so I'll discuss a lot of those later, but this goes to show that just where we are currently with the project, it's an economic way to engage in higher intensity water recycling on plant. So just as a status update of the project, we've been working very hard on minimizing cost, footprint and power consumption, and then ensuring robustness over a range of conditions because this plant will be sent to between uh, nine different sites. So it needs to be able to handle a, a wide range of um, fats, oils and greases, temperatures, flow rates, and be able to operate very autonomously without need for uh, you know, putting a big effort and resource in position on the host site. So the, prime, the major equipment will be one 20 foot containerized microfiltration, ultrafiltration RO system, uh, a 27 meter cube stainless steel feed tank, and then three by five meter cube polycarbonate buffer tanks for uh, ultrafiltration breaker, concentrate and permeate storage, where we'll do a lot of sampling, 
uh, and then a dry cooler loop if we're going above 35 degrees. So I'll talk about the dry cooler a lot in detail. So currently, as an update, the first unit's currently being constructed. We're expecting factory acceptance test in November with delivery to the first host site in December. So this is a general layout of what that would look like. Um, you can see that large feed tank there. So the um, general arrangement of the plant would be the raw water coming into that feed tank, going into the into the container, going through primary uh, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, coming out to the ultrafiltration break tank, going back in, and then your reject and your clean water being stored in separate tanks. So we've designed a slab for this one, um, just about 12, 12 by six meters roughly, about 68 meters square. Um, the megapascal rating on the concrete can be as low as say 25 megapascals, but just to be safe for that um, 27.3 wet weight of the feed tank, we just go with 40. It's not too much of an extra cost uh, with a 200, milli 200 millimeter slab thickness. And then for sites where we are taking water above 35 degrees, which is the design requirement for entry to the microfiltration membrane, there will be a slight extra um, square meterage assigned for that dry cooler loop. So for each individual site, we can assess um, the proposed location. We might not need a slab. We might be able to get away with concrete plinths or if there's already a compact, compacted gravel area, that would also suffice too because we're not looking at huge wet weights. We're looking at, as I mentioned, 27 ton for a feed tank that's about three and a half meter in diameter, about six and a half ton for that container and then about five ton for those um, 1.8 meter diameter small poly. You there, Max? Amanda, can you hear me? Seems like we have a connectivity issue here. Yes, I can hear you. Um, yeah, it's it's broken off from from my end as well. Uh, depending on if if Max joins us or not, I, I can I can take over and talk through the remainder of of the slides. <clears throat> well, Thanks, um, Gareth. And if if Max comes in, maybe just tell him to turn off his camera. He's moving. Um, just whilst I'm bringing up the, the water slides, uh, Matt, were there any questions that came through yet on, um, no, on the water? No problem. <clears throat> I'll just um, open up my version of the slides here. Max, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Micron sacrificial bag filter for the microfilter. Max, he's back. Are you hearing us? Can you hear us, Max? Um, so we've done a few field tests. Yeah. Yeah, Can mate. you hear us? Well, we we unfortunately missed about um, three or four minutes of your Can presentation. Hear me, probably. Yeah, you might have to turn off your camera because we missed about three or four minutes of what oh, you really? just said. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe yeah, um, sure. in, uh, if you want to go back to okay. where you had the, the site plan. Which slide should I go back to? Um, the the site plan, yep. you know, okay. with the tanks. And All the, right. Yeah. That one. Yep, the layout. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, okay. I'll start on this slide again. Um, okay, so this is a general layout of what the plant will look like, where we have raw feed water coming into that feed tank. Um, going into the primary bag filters, microfiltration, ultrafiltration in the in the adjacent container, coming out to that five kiloliter uh, ultrafiltration break tank, going back in to the RO system, and where we have the permeate and the concentrate going into separate tanks. So in terms of the area requirement, you'd be looking at about 12 by six meters for this one, and with that little cutout, it's about 68 meter square slab area. Um, in terms of a megapascal rating for the concrete, the largest weight will be the 27 ton feed tank. 
Um, so that's about three and a half meter in diameter. So approximate calculations, you could get away with maybe a 25 megapascal rate in concrete, but it's no extra cost to go to 40. So it's best to be safe here. And then with a 150 to 200 millimeter slab thickness. And then um, for sites that are take, uh, sorry, recycling waste, Waste water is above 35 degrees, so will be a slight extra square meterage assigned to that dry, dry cooler loop, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but then we'll assess each site's proposed location. We might not even need a slab. We might be able to just use if there's contra uh, compacted gravel already, or um, potentially just some concrete plinths. So this is a basic process flow diagram we've drawn up where I won't spend too much time on it, but you can see at the top left, the raw feed coming into that feed tank, skimming the fat soils and greases off the top, taking the feed water from the bottom, going through a dry, a dry cooler loop, which can operate 24 seven to get that feed water under the design requirement of 35 degrees. And then going into the recycling container, which has just got that blue box around it where we separate particles, concentrate and permeate. So we've been doing a lot of consideration for robust design because when uh, each site is going to be hosting this it's going to be hosted all over the country we're based in Brisbane so we won't be able to be there and we want to try and minimize the amount of effort and resources that the host site has to dedicate to monitoring and operating this plant to about under 15 20 minutes a day um, so with these robust robust design elements we're able to take feed water up to 65 degrees, which will be an easy threshold after use in the plant. Say for example, uh, sterilizer water at 85 degrees used through the plant might be 65, 70, and then a further six and a half hour residence time in that feed water tank where it will be normalizing with the atmosphere. Um, we'll be skimming those fat soils and greases that float to the top, um, take the feed water off the bottom, um, and then a big one is a 50 and a 25 micron sacrificial bag filter in series with each other before the microfiltration. So we've been doing a lot of field tests showing that this, these two will remove about 90% of 90% of fat soils and greases, hence obviously BOD, COD and total organic carbon. Um, so we can tolerate 10 times the design requirement of the, of the membranes. And, you know, just in terms of economics, it's, it's a no brainer if you destroy a $30 bag filter every couple of months versus thousands for a microfiltration, ultrafiltration, or even an RO membrane. So um, that, that's something that we've included in the design there. Um, we've got a fairly long residence time to catch any sort of serious perturbations. Uh, so it's 27% of max capacity. And then the break tank after the uh, ultrafiltration to sample. And then we'll also have a small storage tank to sample that permeate and concentrate for lab uh, assays to prove that it is sufficient in a use for a condenser or a um, boiler makeup water, just so we're not having any issues with that. So cooling is another big one where we've been putting a lot of attention to. So we've elected to go for a dry cooler or an adiabatic cooler. So that's just terminology. Basically, it's essentially a, a radiator in your car or an adi adiabatic cooler. You're just using a moistened pad, so you're absorbing heat through expansion of, of vapors. Uh, so it's an innovative cooling tech versus traditional options of, say, a plate frame heat exchanger or a shell tube heat exchanger, cooling tower or a chiller. Um, so we've shown that this one has the lowest levelized cost of cooling, just as a dollar per kilowatt hour of cooling mostly due to the reduced need for water, um, which obviously dominates the cost of cooling towers or um, shell tube heat exchangers and plate frame heat exchangers. So there's only a, only a power requirement for this one. So as I mentioned, the design requirement that we're targeting is 35 degrees before heading to the microfiltration membrane. Um, so the dry and the wet bulb ambient temperature will rarely exceed this, especially in Southern states. So there won't be any issue with not being able to cool at any time. And then as I mentioned, yeah, the dry cooler loop before the membrane, separate to the membrane enables cooling to be done 24 seven on weekends or when the um, water recycling pilot isn't running. So cooling isn't required just in time, which will further reduce that kilowatt rating of um, cooling plant. 
So this is just a basic um, general arrangement of the container. I won't spend too much time on this one, but you can just see the battery limits in the bottom left there where the feed water comes in, the um, ultra filtration brake comes out and then goes back in. And then in the top right there is where the permeate and the concentrate come out. So hence why I designed that slab as you saw before. Um, so these are just a few sample images of what that would look like. Um, so this isn't what's being deployed for this project, but it's at a similar scale. So you can see at the top left image there is one of the RO membranes. Um, then just a couple of chemical dosing tanks, bottom left and bottom right are the microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes. So you can see that it's not a large footprint. So it can easily fit in a 20 foot container for the kind of volumes that we're processing here. Um, in terms of a power requirement, this is another one that we've been looking at quite a bit. Um, so that's just a single line diagram there's, of, of the plant. There's no need to pay too much attention to that one. Um, so including those concentrate and permeate pumps of roughly about a kilowatt each, you'd need about six kilowatts of three phase power and another and a further six of 240 single phase um, if you're just running without the, without any sort of cooling. And then if you are needing to cool, you'd need another 30 to 50 kilowatts for assuming a COP of three to five for that dry cooler. All right, um, and final slide. Uh, for host sites that will need to perform their own risk assessments, this is just a little register of the chemicals for the pilot plant. So you can see just anti-scale and disinfection, UF membrane clean, RO membrane clean, um, fairly standard water treatment chemicals, nothing nothing too nasty, but it's just something to be aware of and, and have that on your site register and, and be aware of it for your risk assessments. So that was everything I had to say. Um, Matt, were there any questions? Thanks, Max. Um, <clears throat> we haven't had any, oh yes, I've got one, just got on a yep. text message. Um, yep. So that you mentioned that the payback is less than three years. Um, yep. Is that Go is ahead. that for the full scale, i.e. four times bigger than pilot scale, or is it for pilot scale as well? Sorry, Matt, you broke up there. Just say that last ah. sentence again. So you mentioned the payback, or oh, the the pre feasibility. Yep. You know, um, might be yep. different once this uh, project's completed, but the initial um, feasibility sounded really good. Less than three years payback. Yep. So was that calculated on a full scale, which is um, approximately four times bigger than the pilot scale? Um, would it also work for a pilot scale payback? So that was calculated on a pilot scale, and the main note to be aware of there is that is not factoring the cost of any sort of cooling gear. So that's if you're processing, say, a recycled water stream that's already um, being recycled on site and that would be already at the ambient wet bulb temperature. Um, that's that's why that payback is looking quite good. If you're yeah. having to include like a large cooling array, you might double that maybe. Right. But those numbers are based on just that single 100 meter cube per day um, pilot plant scale. Yes. Thanks, Max. And there were, there, I think you had several opportunities as far as the water source was concerned. Oh, for sure. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and the, the cooling, what, only applied to one or two of them? Is that right? I'll quickly go back. Whoop. So it all depends really on um, how long, you know, what's what's the residence time for those streams already. Um, so when we've been going around to the different sites, for example, the sterilizer water has been measured in the mid 40s to mid 50s maybe. Um, so for sure, you know, with a large amount of um, residence time that could equil equilibrate with the ambient conditions fairly closely. Things like bore water would be, um, obviously yeah, wet bulb ambient may be hotter depending on the if it's sub artesian or not. Um, tertiary wastewater treatment plant effluent would be at the wet at the wet bulb so it wouldn't need cooling um, and then recycled water as well probably wouldn't need cooling. So depending on, on um, which streams you're really interested in, which streams are, are, are very clean and you know vol volumin voluminous enough to be uh, 
recycled, you might only need cooling for maybe a third of those. Right, that's good. Thanks, Max. So, you, <clears throat> so there's plenty of choices to get that less than three year payback if you don't need you don't need cooling. There's plenty of choices regarding the water source. Yep. 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 Thanks. Um, that's really good. So that's looking encouraging. First deployment in December. Thanks, Max. Um, so next um, presentation will be from Gareth Ford from All Energy and it's um, on the multi-fuel biomass pilot. So, um, and just as a background to that, we know that combustion of fossil fuels for process heat is one of the hardest to abate emissions for food manufacturers. Uh, and the future cost and reliability of fossil fuels is under threat. So hence the need to find um, viable alternatives um, for biomass. Uh, so this project that Gareth will talk about We'll uh, talk about the pilot, which is also aimed at building confidence and capability in using renewable fuels for thermal energy. So over to you, Gareth. And we, we can't hear thanks you there, Gareth. <coughs> G'day, everyone. And okay, thanks. Thanks for putting the time. Uh, is, how's my, is that coming through okay now? Uh, a bit delayed, but we can hear you okay. Um, maybe if you also turn off your camera. Okay, I'll turn that. Yeah, I'll turn that video off. You don't need to, to see me. Good day, everyone. Thanks for uh, the chance to talk today about um, biomass boilers. <clears throat> really exciting area. Um, the motivation for this is around finding low cost and low greenhouse gas emissions thermal energy. Um, very quickly. If you're using a biomass fuel, it is considered biogenic. That is, it was alive within about the, less, the last 100 years, so there's no carbon dioxide associated emissions. There may be some extremely small nitrous oxide methane emissions, but generally they're going to be you know, less than 1% of the emissions compared to um, the same amount of energy from coal, as an example. The stretch target is a multi fuel biomass boiler where the fuel is costing less than $3 per gigajoule lower heating value, with coal sat at the moment close to $4 to $5 per gigajoule, natural gas sort of in that $12 to $18 per gigajoule, depending on, on which part of the country you're from, um, to really help drive down the, the cost of thermal energy. Um, in terms of the background, taking that circular economy approach, what fuels are available within Exist, existing red meat processor supply chains that could be utilised within that multi-fuel boiler. Um, Dewatered paunch, sludge, materials that aren't able to be recycled via other streams such as um, broken pallets, uh, paper or cardboard that's contaminated with food, etc. The goal here is contributing to the sector achieving an 80% reduction. Um, in emissions or achieving 80% renewable energy use. And there was a uh, summary here from the 2020 Environmental Performance Review. You can see that emissions intensity is definitely tracking in the right direction, but the general trend uh, is not as fast as um, required to hit carbon neutrality by 2030. So a real requirement to, to accelerate that rate of emissions intensity reduction. Hence, uh, biomass boilers providing a solution for that difficult to shift emissions of, of the thermal energy. Um, a super high level SWOT analysis for thermal energy at red meat processing sites. So some strengths, uh, a lot of innovative technologies coming through. So um, fit for purpose biomass boilers, um, routinely able to take up to 35 towards 50% moisture, depending on the technology that's used. There's some um, really innovative technologies coming through on heat pumps, solar thermal collection, um, thermal energy storage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some, the opportunity for circular economy for thermal energy. Um, what are some of the weakness more generally on thermal energy? So securing fuel offtakes, be that coal, be that um, other forms of energy, um, 
can have quite a lot of variability. And business continuity, so as the coal industry has greater interest in exporting coking coal at scale and less interest in thermal coal, it does mean um, access to coal is somewhat limited. Um, you know, once, and, and also for biomass, there is increasing competition for biomass as a fuel. Um, all of these facilities at scale will need in some sort of environmental approval and for, for new plant, um, the CapEx outlay associated with that, somewhat ameliorated by um, low cost equipment financing, which uh, you can get for these sorts of technologies. What are some of the opportunities? So rather than uh, using a fossil fuel that has a very long supply chain, either from um, the wellhead if it's gas or from a distant coal mine, looking at fuels that can be used in the more adjacent area and so looking at opportunity to support local jobs, be it um, in a timber mill, be it out of a forestry operation, be it out of um, possibly in the future, not part of this trial, but a, a good long-term um, source of energy being recycled wood, recycled construction demolition wood from local council, local council um, landfills. Um, and the social license to operate, they're really driving down greenhouse gas emissions using fuel that's you know, ideal, hopefully abundant and local. Some of the threats, New Zealand's banning low and medium temperature coal-fired boilers. So there's um, a big movement within the red meat processing, um, uh, dairy processing, milk processing sectors in New Zealand to move away from coal-fired boilers in particular in the South Island. UK is implementing a gas and oil boiler ban. Um, I saw that the Victorian state government is uh, uh, not allowing installation of natural gas distribution into new housing developments. So, you know, it's something I didn't think I'd see in my working career. So there's a huge amount of change in what fuels are being accepted under different jurisdictions. If you look at Australia being maybe five to 10 years behind um, the, uh, Europe in terms of environmental policy, maybe in the order of 2030, you might see bans on new coal-fired or new um, gas-fired boilers or, or um, coming into play. You know, that's really crystal ball gazing, but something that's certainly happening in other jurisdictions to be aware of when you're making a selection on procuring a new boiler. This is the main game in terms of really driving down that dollar per gigajoule lower heating value. So this is um, effectively an East Coast Australia summary of everything available to um, businesses for generating thermal energy. And if we zoom in, in here on the ones of interest <clears throat> in this presentation, so we've got paunch at different moisture contents, pretty, pretty common moisture contents, and assuming a $40 per tonne um, haulage cost to remove paunch from the site, and so not allowing for any disposal of further handling costs, you can see an opportunity for avoided costs. Um, where that paunch can be utilised on site. When you compare, say, to a pretty common sort of black coal used on the eastern seaboard, $4.56 per gigajoule, air dried hardwood chip in a lot of places is very competitive. Um, the, the negative of biomass is that the existing, or the majority of the existing red meat processing boiler fleet is not well suited to these high moisture mixtures of multifuel. So hence the demand for, for this pilot to look at those different technologies to take in paunch, to take in um, wood chip products and, and other wider sources of biomass. So I'll talk about those in a moment. And, and certainly when you compare these to natural gas pricing up in the teens in terms of dollars per gigajoule, um, the economics can be can be quite strong. Looking specifically at the pilot status update, this was um, the third most subscribed project after the environmental survey and the water recycling project was, was the second most popular. Um, uh, moving into fabrication now for the 40 foot containerized boiler and then an associated 20 foot fuel feeding system. I'll show you a plan of that. Um, the pilot is planned to be hosted at three processing plants with um, planning for extending that further into more sites. Um, factory acceptance testing plan for approximately February 2022, delivery to host site number one approximately April 2022 next year. 
Um, looking at the system that was selected, running with an EOS 45 rated to 523 kilowatts thermal. This was selected because of the um, automatic tube cleaning, hydraulic moving grate. It's very scalable um, up to off the shelf units to 5.8 megawatts and you can go bigger than this by having units operating in parallel. The pilot will consume approximately five, 5.1 tonnes per day of biomass if it's right at the um, fuel specification for the boiler and generating um, up to about 300 kilograms per day of ash, that's combined bottom ash and fly ash. Um, I'll talk through the different sec sections of, of this unit. Um, this adheres to the um, UK um, Clean Energy Act requirements and various European Union requirements. Emissions to air within the European Union are uh, routinely more stringent than the state-based EPAs in Australia. So um, um, it, it normally puts the EPA's mind at ease where you have a European designed and fabricated unit that's approved for use under their uh, Clean Air Act requirements. Some of the big advantages to this particular unit is those three combustion chambers, primary, secondary and tertiary air, a high residence time, so a high volume within here ensuring um, full combustion of the particulates and then full combustion of carbon monoxide as well to reduce carbon monoxide. There's a recycle of flue gas to drive down NOx and particular emissions are further reduced via the use of a multi-cyclone. At scale, you may also choose to install a bag filter further um, to recover fly ash. There's an um, automated bottom ash handling system as well. Um, the efficiency of the EOS 45, nominally about 90% um, at um, full rated output, and can retain reasonably good efficiencies even at low fire modes down to 30%. The larger scale um, EOS systems are, are able to achieve efficiencies of about 93%, which is really good. That's, um, that's a really, really high efficiency um, for this tile of baller. Some plan and side views for the pilot. Um, there's the 20 foot fuel um, handling system here. With a hydraulic lid, fuel can be loaded, for example, via a, a front end loader, um, can hold roughly five cubic metres of fuel, then algorithm into the combustion chamber itself. You can see here uh, an external ash handling system. This is a maintenance access zone here, um, cleaning zone, um, control panel, and then the flue stack here. Um, I'll show you some images now of the actual boiler itself. So an EOS 45 currently being fabricated by Unicomfort. This um, uh, system is placed on top of the um, fuel feed alga hydraulic ram, hydraulic ram unit for getting the fuel in. You can see uh, that's sort of a different angle of the, the same unit. Combustion air inlets and then the the moving grate system, the combustion chamber itself, and then the heat exchanger um, going on top there with the air receiver for the pneumatic air auto tube cleaning system um, for that boiler. And then it's just a slightly different angle there so you can see the, the depth of the boiler. <coughs> that unit is then um, pre-installed into a 40 foot shipping container. Um, you can see the, the, the end door there, access doors, um, flue stack. Um, it is oversized, so that's, um, we'll, that's taken into account for the transportation and for the system that we've got in mind that that 20 foot container will be installed adjacent to, to the boiler. And then just a view um, within the, um, the container itself, control panel and boiler system. Just a couple of images from, from its scale systems. You can see the tube bundle there for the larger fire tube boiler. Um, uh, refractory bricks, which will be pre-installed um, at the plant. Um, 
here's uh, an example of a, a larger scale um, four megawatt thermal um, biomass boiler with a one megawatt organic rank and cycle power generation system, um, which is, is quite a, um, an interesting innovation with these sorts of facilities where you can generate power and thermal energy out of the, the one system. Um, and these style of boilers have been run on, on grape waste, grape mark, um, coffee grounds, prunings, all sorts of nutshells um, with the, at the, on the eastern seaboard, macadamia nuts or almond shells, um, pips, um, olive pips, stone fruit pips, corn hobs, construction demolition waste, all, all manner of woody materials from um, you know, forestry type mulch all the way through to wood chip anything else that can be pelletized. Um, having a look now at the fuels. So this is where we're looking to make the really, really big gains. Um, paunch is produced by most red meat processes. Um, it's not going to be at a moisture level suited for off the shelf biomass boilers. Um, if you're getting your paunch down towards sort of uh, into the 50s, um, or yeah, so uh, let's say moisture at about 50% or, or slightly less, um, there are some understoke pile boilers that are designed for handling very high moisture content, which might be suitable. That style of technology is not suitable for a transportable 40 foot shipping container, so it's not selected for this one. But um, Paunch will only provide a fraction of the thermal energy needed at a red meat processing plant with rendering. So what you would need to do is blend all that paunch with other forms of fuel. Once that paunch is blended with other fuels, you're able to get a, a multi-fuel or a mixed fuel to an appropriate um, specification. So for the EOS 45, requires a lower heating value of 11 gigajoules per tonne, fuel density 230 to 400 kilograms per cubic metre, fuel top size 30 mil, moisture has got to be less than about 42.8% ash less than seven. So if you start looking at different blends, if you start with say a 66% moisture paunch, um, it's very close to a 50-50 mix with air dried hardwood chip um, with the threshold that um, you're bumping up against first being this lower heating value of the fuel, um, certainly acceptable from an overall moisture and acceptable from an ash. 56% um, moisture, so if you start dropping that moisture down, um, you can then have a, a, a higher mass fraction or higher mass percentage of paunch. So in this particular example, 57.5% paunch, 42.5% wood chip, once again, you're bumping up against the lower heating value specification with moisture at 35.7 and ash at an acceptable level. When you look at the biomass market and procuring a fuel for a biomass boiler, what you're generally gonna be looking for is a fuel that has the highest gigajoule per cubic meter. So biomass is reasonably light, has a reasonably low density. So a truck bringing biomass to a to a feedlot or a processing plant will normally be volume limited. So what does that mean? What, you, what you're gonna be looking for is um, a biomass that has low moisture, high density, not only mass density, but also a high energy density in terms of gigajoules per cubic meter, ideally a low, a low ash value. And that, this, this number here, the net wet calorific value is the really, really important number. It's, it's that lower heating value number taking into account the, the presence of water. So as you can see with all of these paunch samples, they all have a positive net wet calorific value. So they will release more energy than the energy required for the latent heat of evaporation of the water present in the paunch. And if you can have a, say, a mechanical press that's really getting that free water out, you know, you can start to hit you know, reasonably good lower heating values there. So as you can see, mixing paunch with the hardwood chip to hit about 11 gigajoules per tonne means at 50-50. In, in practice, the, 
the ratio for most red meat processing plants with rendering would be closer to about 80% hardwood chip and about 20% paunch. So in most instances, um, sites would be consuming more energy from um, a hardwood chip than from the paunch. Um, really low sulfur, um, chlorine and, and other contaminant levels within the hardwood chip. These are at the um, detectable levels for this particular sample that was run. Um, you know, so you know, re really good level of energy there. Um, just looking at paunch, um, you know, sulfur, chlorine can be um, at levels which is starting to get interest, but certainly not above acceptable thresholds. If you start having a look at coal, you can see coal has a much higher sulfur, reasonable commensurate um, chlorine levels with, with paunch. Um, and it's quite interesting, coal does have quite a high ash content. You know, if you look at coal returning sort of 10 to 14% ash, hardwood at 0.9% of that. And depending on, on what sort of paunch you have, um, overall the ash percentage for the biomass fuel, even, even including paunch, should be lower than what's been generated out of coal. Okay, having a look at installation considerations. So this is discussing the pilot specifically, but also just talking more generally um, about biomass boilers. So some considerations if you were doing things at site. The pilots themselves will be under the operational control of the host sites. So host, host sites are responsible for all those statutory approvals that may be required environmental. Council development application state based EPA approvals. So, this is a small pilot. It's an ancillary activity to the main activity going on at site. Um, um, it's not, not expected that any development application or material change of use or EPA approval is required. Certainly, under um, uh, Queensland Environmentally Relevant Activity requirements, the threshold's about um, 500 kilograms per hour, so the pile will be about half that. Um, so, you know, not anticipating um, any major environmental approvals there, but that will really need to be considered on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, what's a specific example there? So a particular um, development approval for a red meat processor may only specify the use of coal in the boiler, whereas another development approval may specify the size of the boiler that's used. So you just need to check, um, you know, that, that the pilot is an ancillary activity to what's going on and is allowed under the development approval that's existing. And then health and safety requirements. So we're calling it a boiler, but um, this particular system will be generating 95 degrees Celsius hot water. So that avoids the need for um, registering um, as a pressure vessel, but at scale, if you're making steam, you'd need to obviously register as a pressure vessel, have the appropriate pressure relief valves or bursting discs associated with those pressurized systems. Um, I've mentioned building approvals, you know, the building code may come into play if you're building a, a boiler house over a particular size, if there's vegetation removal, if there's a book, bushfire zones and flooding. Um, we've spoken about fuel source, fuel costs, um, mixing is an interesting one. So for the smaller pilot, it'll probably be mixed with a front end loader on a um, on a pad and loading in at about f five tonnes per day where that pilot is run 24 um, seven. You know, if you're only running one or two shifts a day, the, the tonnes of biomass used per day will obviously come down. Um, we've talked about it's generating hot water. Um, in terms of tie-ins, is there an existing manifold to tie into, or um, will it be a standalone heat reticulation system? For the pilot, um, it's 17 kilowatt um, fully installed load. 10 of that's for the boiler itself, mostly that primary, secondary, and tertiary air, and some for the, for the fuel feeding, and about seven kilowatts fully installed load for the balance of plant. The steady state load will, will be lower than this overall. Just to give you a sense of its scale for a 5.8 megawatt boiler, that's consuming about 65 kilowatts of energy. So you do have a, um, a better overall power efficiency when you're using that bigger boiler. Um, 
ash, as mentioned, you've got your, your bottom ash and your fly ash overall, it's about 300 kilograms per day. Um, and you will need to give some consideration to fuel storage. So at scale, is that under a shed or is that being stockpiled on, on a pad? Um, will you have an automated fuel mixing system? For example, two separate hoppers with variable speed drive motors for algas so you control the mass flow of different fuels being fed into the boiler or are you happy for that to be more manual where the mixing of the fuel occurs with a front end loader and, and you might have a, a day hopper feeding into the boiler. So with an eye on the time, I'll, um, I'll wrap up my, my presentation there. Um, uh, yeah, Rex, a um, couple yep. of questions. Yep. Um, just came through on the text. <clears throat> Referring to the sample fuels page, is this indicative of what's being tested in the pilot? That's correct. Yep. Right. That, that's right. So each each site, <clears throat> in terms of the the other fuels available to it, will be unique. Um, you know, it's one example, if you're near a cotton gin, there may be cotton gin trash or, or other material available. Um, if you're near a forestry operation, it might be a more of a forestry mulch. If, if you're near a sawmill, it could be a different material. If, you, if, you've, um, if you're near a, a council landfill, it might be, you know, a, a, a woody or, or, or biomass material available from the as, as a byproduct of those landfilling operations. So each site will um, need to procure um, biomass. We'll be looking for a source of biomass that's adjacent to each operation. And, and as I mentioned, from an economic perspective, um, that fuel that has the, the best dollar per gigajoule lower heating value, which is normally closely correlated with the energy density, so the highest gigajoule per cubic metre of the fuel. And when you look at the wood, it's quite an interesting scenario. So if you've got that lovely smelling cypress with antibacterial properties or, or bark, that tends to be used quite a lot um, in gardening, landscaping operations, and is a, a much higher dollar per cubic metre or dollar per tonne. When you start to look at, say, managed eucalypt plantations where that would may be used for um, um, quite returnly for, for pulp, paper pulp. It's quite a strong export market in, into Asia for that or um, other woods for, for timber. Um, the thinnings and the prunings and the, the, the other sort of byproducts when they harvest that tends to be at quite a low value. Um, Right. The operations in those forestry areas will normally be at, be at scale and will quite often have chipping and, and um, wood chip handling equipment to generate a, um, a chip with, say, a top size of 30 mil um, at those forestry operations or at the timber milling operations, and, and that can be procured. And, you know, that hardwood chip is less desirable for land uh, for landscaping or, or gardening applications. It's a bit harder underfoot. and you know, isn't considered to look as nice. So it, it, it is uh, has less opportunity cost associated with with hardwood chip compared to things like say a cypress or a, or a bark product. And there was a second part to that, yep. to that question as well. Uh, for a non-render plant, yep. uh, would that, uh, would they be able to utilize a bigger percentage of their paunch? You know, yes. You know, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So a non-rendering plant, the major um, thermal energy requirements will be for sterilisation water, cleaning water, um, and those sorts of elements. So your, your thermal energy will quite often come down by at least least half and, and probably more. Um, so yes, that that if you have a red meat processor without rendering, you might be bumping up against the um, the lower heating value threshold. So, you know, you're at 50% paunch, 50% 50 hardwood. So you'd need to consider a number of options there. One would be further mechanical pressing. So you might have a, a newer fan press style dewatering system that has tighter tolerances and a greater um, back pressure on the system to really push out more of the water. Um, gen generally the best 
I've seen is sort of around that sort of 55 to 48 percent moisture so if you're hitting those levels you're at a pretty good you know you're at a, at a pretty good level so you should, you know you'd probably be able to drive up your your paunch percentage maybe towards that you know, that sort of 57 60 percent paunch with about 40 percent wood chip um, your Can other we, option hmm. is rather than a say a moving grate style boil looking at an understoked pile burner with a really really big thick refractory wall that can handle um, a, a higher moisture moisture percentage and a, has a lower um, heating value requirement. Right. I did get another one. If you heard the D in the background, I did get another one. Uh, text. Yes. Uh, it says, um, has nutrient loading increases been considered when dewatering paunch material? Yeah, that's a great question. The short answer is no, it, it, it has not been considered. Um, it where a site has paunch at a, at a much higher moisture percentage and then a, a different dewatering technology or, or more dewatering occurs, yes, that, that paunch press water that's generated has a very high BOD, high suspended solids content and will put a greater load on the wastewater treatment plants. So yeah, ec excellent point. That would definitely need to be considered. Um, would need to be considered if you if you're removing more free water out of the paunch. Um, yep. Having having looked at different dewatering, be it you know alga or, or fan press technologies, you know you you do want some mechanical um, dewatering so that 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 paunch is able to be handled. But to to quote a, an environmental scientist I was speaking to on this, you know the solution is dilution in that rather than spending large amounts of capex and opex treating that paunch by by blending that paunch with a dry um, biomass the final mixed multi-fuel um, can be um, suitable for a boiler at a lower cost of, of supply and, and processing it's just a matter of optimizing that the level of dewatering and the availability of the biomass that you're blending with to meet the fuel specification of the boiler um, in mind. So if you look at a traditional coal-fired boiler, this lower heating value for the fuel will be higher. Um, you know, the moisture threshold will, will be lower. Um, the fuel feeding system would probably be less suited to those, you know, wetter, more sort of claggy biomass fuels, but rather it's more used to that sort of drier coal so that the fuel handling system will also need to be um, considered as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Um, I don't have any more questions, and there's none on the um, on the web side either, on the web either. Um, did you have it? Were you going to say something to Max? Were you, Gareth? Uh, no, I I um I didn't have any any more slide there. I I just had a little bit more information on um, emissions to air around what this. You know the, the the newer fleet of biomass boilers driving down carbon monoxide particulate and um, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's really um, just some further background in, information on that. But that's great. That's all the the main um, content I wanted to present today. Great, thanks very much. So that's um, that's an hour, and we fitted a lot of information into one hour. So um, there's no doubt further to come on this, as we know, because um, these pilots have just just about to start construction. So we'll be updating members again further down the track as we get some progress. Um, if there's no further questions, it doesn't look like there is, I'll, I'll hand back to a, I'll thank Max and, and Gareth for their great presentation and hand back to Amanda. Thanks everyone and thanks Matt, Max and Gareth um, for today's presentation. Really interesting and really informative um, in and you know exciting space to be watching over the next sort of 12 to 18 months as these pilots get rolled out. Thanks everyone for joining. This webinar will actually be uploaded onto the AMPC YouTube site and should be there tomorrow. So if you need, um, would like to share it or re-watch any of it, um, feel free to go to the YouTube site to get that. 
just a thing out for next week's webinar. Next week's webinar will be a presentation from the Department of Agriculture giving us an update um, from their perspective. And we've also got Dr. Ian Norton uh, from Respond Global giving a COVID update as well. So that will be next Thursday at uh, 2, 2 p.m. New South Wales time. All right, enjoy your afternoon, everyone, and we'll see you shortly. See ya.